Yo dog, Kenny Boucher here, next level painting, hitting you up on the literal best of all days. Coming to you from that beat slab in Hollywood, California, we're doing it again. It's been a long time, shouldn't have left you without a dope beat to step to Death Guard finale. We're finally wrapping up the video series on my personal Death Guard project. I finished it. If you follow me on Instagram, you may have seen that. I've already done some things that are not in the video series, like some defilers, a cool display board, and etc. I wasn't going to film the entire project the whole time. Still got to be some moments that are just for me to crack out on my art. Now, rhinos on their surface, kind of boring, old tank, but we did a lot to spice them up. So special thanks to Spellcrow and my boy, White Turk and Jack Clips Painting for setting me up with some uniqueness in my vehicle so that I can have a personal art day on how I nurture the Nurgle feeling out of some of these add-ons. There's some Easter eggs in this video on what our next project might be. I'm hearing some savage echoes in the distance. I'm gonna show you guys the end of the video at the beginning of the video because I'm a marketing genius. Today is the conclusion of our Death Guard series. I'm gonna lock these rhinos in, show you guys that Nurgle style, how we did all these cool effects. It's a little bit more tricky and involved than it seems, but this is it. If you guys wanna go back in time, check out the other three installments have at it. I'm using that new Monument Hobbies primer, that black brown. You may have seen this in the previous video where we covered the Plague Burst Crawlers. It's a good setup because black brown is actually my first base coat. So starting black brown, pretty handy because I'm looking for something really dark to start with and then get my black brown to stick over. This is just the way to do it. Now we're using the Spell Crow hatches. Spell Crow came in clutch for this project with some Marines, some add-on parts. I've got some 3D printed dozer blades. Shout out to Wyatt Turk at Jack of Clubs Painting for designing those. Special for our project, they've got a couple of forge world add-on parts. Just kind of a mash of cool shit to make these old box tanks look fresh, which is also why it's kind of tricky to paint. So right out the gate, we're just throwing down some black brown over our black brown primer and you'll notice that the black brown primer is like a little bit darker which is kind of perfect because it's like more black brown and so when i start laying down my base coats of black brown it's kind of like a built-in like shadow already now as always with the death guard project we start mixing in our bright yellow green directly into our black brown all monument hobby pro acryl and this is going to be kind of our highlight right we're basically using black brown to keep the paint dark this is sort of like considered our mid-tone, the, uh, the yellow green, but then we use bright warm gray as our final highlights. And so when you're doing a big box tank like this, it's really important to make sure all your transitions are smooth. It's up to you how dramatic you wanna push those highlights and those shadows. The more extreme, the less real, right? The more subtle, the more real. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of split the difference on this project. Most of all, you want a flawless transition game. Now that comes from two things, guys. The first thing is respecting the value progression. If we're going from dark to bright, no matter what colors we picked, you don't want to just jump straight to it. You want to take your time. You want to get that gumbo. You want to marriage. So when you respect the value game, that's step one. Step two, lowering the opacity. You really want to get comfortable operating with a thinner mix and just learning how to use your trigger pull to mitigate any ocean build up any excessive moisture. Now, here we go. We're respecting that value game, right? We threw in a little of the bright yellow green to the mix, and now we're throwing a little bit more in. And we're just gonna kind of keep reinforcing, coaxing that flawlessness, no speckle, no grain. Kind of one of the secrets of airbrushing. People are like, oh, you know, got grainy or got spe speckly. How do you mitigate that? Well, the secret is, is that like, you can't. It's always there. That's just kind of how it paints. It throws out a sheet of, you know, pixelated paint. The visibility of that pixelated paint directly comes from how opaque you are and how close to the previous step you are. So by respecting both of those angles, you kind of make it invisible, therefore flawless. Now we're going to start adding in our bright, warm gray. Now this is even more important. The brighter you go, right? The more you step that value game up. The more you deviate from the previous position, the more like low opacity, the more transparent you want your mix to be, the more in control, the more you wanna just nurture it, especially on these big box tanks. They're just basically big flat canvases. So any graininess, any, any distortion is just like straight exposed. It's not like smaller infantry models. So we've, got it, we've done a good job of balancing that drama with a little bit of that realism. I'm pretty happy with this. Now onto that next step. It's time to tie in certain features 
of this model with already established theme elements from what we've already done. This is a really fun journey we're about to go on, guys. This is where I like to really get my meditation from my painting. Now that we've done all that airbrushing, it's time to jump into the nitty gritty. Now you can see there's a lot of theme already established in my Death Guard project. We got a lot of them cyans and the magentas, them yellows. That's kind of the color of our Nurgle corruption. And now we have to incorporate that into our Rhino. The difficulty though is that it doesn't have like nearly as segregated, uh, like sectioned off uh, bordered pieces. So we're gonna have to figure out a way to use our brush game to sort of softly blend those things in and make them look really natural and at the technique level of the rest of our force. So we're gonna kinda just lay out a lot of the colors, like right out the gate, you see in the top there is the colors of our airbrush progression. Here's some of the blues I like, like a transparent blue, a dark blue, a sky blue, I got some purples, some magenta, some whites, just a kind of a range of all the colors of the project. And now what we're gonna be doing is kinda using a combination wet glaze, glazing, wet blending to get this all done. Now when I'm doing the wet blend, what I'm trying to do is keep my paint relatively high opacity and semi moist. And then I can kind of move into the wet glaze world where I'm leaving it low opacity and moist and then traditional glazing, I'm kind of keeping it low opacity and low moisture. So right at the gate, we're kind of like making a mix of our greens and sort of shifting the blue, right? So I'm not even glazing, I'm just brute force just made that mix. I just took the color of the rhino and then blended some blue into it. And we're laying it down hot and heavy, right? Pretty opaque, pretty wet and just kind of running it into the armor of the vehicle. Now, this is very brutish and it works, okay? And then from there, we can kind of start modulating it while it's still wet. And now I'm kind of pivoting to more of a wet glaze because since I already have like the background of the vehicle showing those greens, then it doesn't necessarily matter if what I'm doing over it is opaque or not. If you can see through it a little bit, that's better. That's where the blend comes from, right? And then I'm kind of, meanwhile, just cheating, cheating some of these colors that were modulating into the base color of that brown, green, and bright one gray. We're just, like I said, raw dog mixing that on our palette. So you see, we got all this stuff here. We're gonna kind of start choosing what's gonna be what. So I'm gonna just start kind of blocking in areas that are gonna be more blue than others. I'm gonna kind of just feel it out, kind of border it. And then again, the reason we're using this mix where we actually threw a lot of that brown and green in there is because where it links to the actual color of the armor, we're gonna be basically adding more moisture so it lowers the opacity and kind of just spreading it thin and kind of converting it into a filter, right? It's a very quick, very dirty way of painting, but as long as you're using all the same paints for the project, it's, it's pretty, pretty simple. So now you see we're doing the same thing with our purple base coats. We're just sneaking some of that brown and green into our purples, kind of making what the colors should look like if they were blended together. And then from there, we can decide if we need to lower the opacity or keep the opacity high by the introduction of more or less moisture. Because at the end of the day, painting is just moisture and opacity. So we're laying it down, semi-opaque, kind of wet. So sort of that brutish kind of lazy glazy area. And again, this works because I already have a bunch of color there. Color information exists. If this was just primer black, this would be like a thousand coats and I would be definitely ramping up the opacity. But you see, I'm letting it kind of spill into the territory, spill into the vehicle itself. And then I'm just kind of kind of creeping in our bright yellow greens and our bright warm grays, really low opacity. And it's just kind of softly blending because it's going to kind of let all the colors of the armor peek through. This is the hardest part of the project is getting this incredibly crafty looking rhino hatch from Spellcrow to mutate into the armor and look natural, right? So again, we're just pushing and pulling. We're finding the areas that we want to be a little bit more magenta. We're sneaking a little bit more of our vehicle airbrush color palette into it, keeping the opacity a little low, keeping it deliberately a little rough and wet, maybe randomly stippling in. It's okay if it gets a little like textured to the appearance. Only thing I'm really trying to avoid is texture to the touch. The blends don't need to be super smooth just yet. So again, we're just gonna start dialing it in, ramping up the brightness factor of that magenta and start working it toward the tops of things, the peaks of these things. And again, I don't need to be super blendy here, right? A little bit brutish, just deploy it, hit it, quit it, move around, let it do its thing. Gonna just jump into the blues, do the same thing. And by lowering the opacity and progressively working toward the tips, and the tops of things, we're gonna sort of get this like cell shaded blending to occur that we can always smooth out with more traditional glaze technique. 
but a lot of my projects this is kind of how i do it just kind of this brew force wet glaze wet blend just lay it down just you know don't make it confusing just use the same colors from your palette on your wet palette that you already airbrushed with and see here now we're just going to start dialing in the bluer the bluer colors and we're going to be ramping up the opacity i'm kind of pulling these paints right off the palette and i'm not like stopping for more moisture and that's ramping up the opacity and then i'm able to use the moisture already present on that region to kind of just stipple in the capillary effect to kind of force the paint to blend the waters kind of look at all like these beads of moisture on a surface are kind of looking to connect right and become one swirl together so just by kind of exploiting that concept i'm able to get really fast really rapid fire blends uh but this is a labor of love to kind of just get it to blend flawlessly into the armor panel and you see i'm just kind of introducing more and more blue here and there lowering the opacity now we're jumping into the big ass bright greens a lot more opaque but then we're knocking it down with some of the browns of the real estate around it on the panel and we're just constantly manipulating the opacity and the moisture right because you guys probably noticed that when your paint's too wet you don't have control so what i'm doing is getting the paint really wet here to lower the opacity and then i'm taking some of the moisture off with a paper towel and through this technique i'm going to be in more control and i'm going to be able to kind of start stacking highlights on top of things and just kind of keep adding the brighter color stacking the opacity it's kind of like an optical illusion this blue i chose is definitely brighter than the blue already there but like kind of every time i do a stack let it dry for a second and hit the stack again as i'm going through my tempo it starts to look brighter and brighter and brighter because it's becoming less informed by what is under it the same thing goes here in these magentas like obviously it's a brighter magenta i made it brighter but the fact that i can keep going back and forth with the same mix and getting a slightly brighter result is that optical illusion of it becoming less informed by what's underneath it and so now we're just bouncing around using a more traditional glazing technique where we lower the opacity and the moisture okay now that i've got a good blend it's got good texture it looks nice and beat up we're going to convert more to an edge highlight technique a little bit more brute uh because traditionally i would define my edge highlight technique is uh lowering the uh moisture level and keeping the, the opacity content high right so here you're going to see me bouncing around doing both where i'm, I'm not going to be afraid to deploy a little bit more moisture and use again the brutish wet glazing technique where i can actually just kind of on the fly capillary it back down because i'm really just skipping between three blues right one of my blues is keeping it dark one of my blues is keeping it bright and one of the blues in between is kind of just like the hyper saturation blue so since in my mind i kind of know what my blues are there for it's not too hard to like just go back and forth push and pull in real time you know laying it down kind of opaque like this and then if i need to reach for more moisture and kind of spread it out i can just moving around see i just reincorporate a little bit more of the dark blue kind of back blend back to the highlight i'm just ramping up the opacity here less moisture generating a little bit more intrigue then again i modify introduce more moisture and it's just a little dance right this is the fun shit about painting this type of painting this is when i put my headphones on this is what i'm listening to audiobooks and this is when i can lose hours of my life just endlessly pushing and pulling and having fun and keeping the paints really like really thin and just kind of giving me endless opportunity to go back and forth in my blending so again we're going to be target locking the tops of things ramping up the brightness factor the value of our magentas and we're going to be deliberately start getting more and more aggressive more and more sharp as we move further and further away from the base blend and that's going to help us ramp up the definition ramp up the contrast maybe create and make it a little bit shinier looking a little bit wetter looking to it uh visually not literally and so far so good we got a really good result but it could be better right we could go harder so what i'm going to do is now i'm going to introduce a little bit of straight up red okay and this is actually i believe transparent red which has a very uh rapid thinning like property like it's very heavily pigmented but the second you start thinning it it turns, starts to kind of turn almost magenta so now i'm going to be deploying more of a pin wash technique right where i'm lowering the opacity a little bit keeping it deliberately kind of wet and i'm just going to start sending it into where the shadows are between the corruption and the armor panels and that's going to help lift it right sharpen the image and if i see it's just a little too aggressive i'll just modify add a little bit more moisture keep going so like a nice dark purple or dark blue mixed into that that red really gives you that look and now we're going to bounce around sharpen the peaks of things again hit the tops start introducing brighter and brighter colors maybe even some white and anything that we that still needs to be addressed we'll just move back to that like we're going to just grab some of our bright warm gray some of our bright yellow green 
and we're going to start kind of manipulating uh, the teeth, maybe introducing a little bit of yellow. I like throwing a little yellow into my bone colors, uh, try to just make it different than a stock brown to white workup. So it's a good base color. Again, I've got some yellow in the browns. We're just going to kind of keep ramping up the opacity, therefore getting a little brighter. And then again, we'll start introducing a totally new value that will keep brightening it. Maybe a bright one gray, maybe an ivory. It's up to you. Even stock white would work here. It would desaturate it a little bit though. So picking out like ivories and stuff are usually pretty handy for uh, maintaining a little bit more saturation in the spectrum. But I'm not too worried about it. I'm just trying to get some nice clean blends, sharp lines, make those teeth look really scary as that like who would go inside the hatch like fuck that thing right so again let's just creep in a little bit of our ivory into that overall mix kind of keep the blend alive never forgetting the rule of not disrespecting the value sequence we don't just go from this color to the brightest we're always going to kind of keep splitting the difference tweaking it going a little brighter and then at some point we're going to stop and we are going to go to our maximum brightness using our edge highlight game low low moisture content resulted in high opacity and we're just going to kind of draw very carefully using our heart pull strategy tip of the brush kind of pulling straight back try to create nice strong shiny lines on those teeth just back and forth back and forth right and you can kind of just keep seeing like they, every pass we do is like a sharpening filter like a contrast filter right it gets a little sharper so every time i make the bright things bright i'm typically going to also try to look to make dark things darker if, until i find i have enough looking solid jumping in making dark things darker as stated we're going back to that like transparent red purple and we're going to kind of just like border the teeth kind of get into that shadow area really sharpens the image jumping around bringing in a new hue so like the hue like we're bringing an interesting color that we're also trying to make it darker than the teeth right so that there's this border and it's all just optics we're just making things sharper visually easier to see all right, a lot of people, they focus really heavily on the highlight game. Got to make it brighter. Got to make it brighter. But like a lot of times, making things, the dark things darker is where that sharpness comes from. The way I like to describe it is the sharpness comes from the dark stuff and that HD quality comes from the bright stuff. So we're just going to kind of bounce around, hit some of these boils built into the armor plates, hit them with our bright yellow green. We're just generating a lot more opacity here, a lot less moisture. We don't want to linger on these little small spots too much. Just want to make them look good. You deploy more of an edge highlight game. We're going to start picking some out of the blue to generate a little bit more intrigue instead of it just being all blue. Now you can see some green boils and it's just fun back and forth. I've got three of these rhinos to do, but don't worry, guys. I'm only going to kind of show you this one because it's my favorite one. You can kind of see like the techniques I use to do this. And, you know, since I'm here and I already have the rhino colors, I'll just start like sketching in some edge highlights on some of these plates so I can kind of start getting a better visual look here. Any hard crisp line, I'm just going to use the tracer technique, scrape the edge of my brush on it, start deploying it. And again, I'm going to respect the values. I'm going to be using not only our bright warm gray, but our green and our brown. And I'm going to just kind of use my artist I to scan the real estate and to see what's visually appropriate as I ramp up the brightness and something kind of cool I like to do here is kind of start stippling in using the tip of my brush and just really respect those values don't jump too bright too soon right just drop some you know real estate appropriate stipples in off the edges kind of helps you with that texture and then as you brighten up the mix and start hitting those corners and those edges brighter and brighter you can deploy a few more stipples kind of increasing the resolution in certain areas and decreasing it at others, giving you a nice visual effect. Looking solid, beautiful labor of love. Now for these other angles, I like to keep it more crisp. Like I said, I'm using the, the flat of my brush. I'm just trying to use a really clean technique where I'm using horizontal brush strokes, trying to lock into those sharp rails, skirt the edge, trace as it were, and generate nice sharpness on the more mechanical parts as they move away from the corrupted parts and just take our time always scan the real estate you know it's just some combination of the brown the green and the white and the bright one gray and it's up to you to just use your eye and determine what is the safest bet what's going to get me my result without being so like fail rate infused and then you just kind of keep ramping it up as you move into that territory very simple very easy on these space marine box vehicles because they're all just clean crisp 90 degree angles and i'm going to just kind of go ultra fast 
we're going to take everything we learned on the top hatch and we're just going to reapply it to the front panel here that spell crow tongue uh those lights and we're just going to rapid fire do everything we just did super fast time lapse you see we just went through all those blues we mixed in our browns we just built up those base coats we started lazy glazy wet blending our brighter uh cyan zen start introducing some more of those uh whites to the peaks make the tops of things brighter make sure that you go in and pin wash shadows you want to lift it again we're just going to go gangster mode because that top patch kind of was like our practice bed and now we're just like oh i got this figured out much quicker on the second pass build up those magentas don't forget some transparent red some whites pushing and pulling never forgetting that our base colors are that black brown that bright yellow green and that bright warm gray so knowing that that's our baseline we can always kind of infuse any hue with those to generate the result we want now we are going to do some awesome flamey yellow and orange effects and i'll tell you the quickest best way to create a really gangster yellow orange pop is to start by painting the real estate white just paint it white first then paint it yellow and then just introduce your oranges and reds that will maintain the highest degree of saturation and i'll cover that here more later in the video Sometimes you gotta just jump around, lock certain things in before you move on. And I'm not even saying like that's just the best route for efficiency. Sometimes it's just for your mental <laughs> efficiency. Let's reset the all wet palette. Let's throw out some metallics. Let's just cut in some deets real quick, guys. So I'm just throwing some dark silver down, some gold, some bronze, kind of swirl them together. This is our iconic Deathless Metal remix using the Monument Hobbies Pro Krill. <clears throat> We're gonna use a pretty high level of opacity. Um, medium moisture we're just going to go quickly black things in using our brushes appropriate brush size for the task you switch between my little guy my big guy cutting all that trim and it's not a whole lot of trim but there is more than normal because of these extra armor bits that i was able to score off of ebay cut in, make things just straight metal be careful not to get it on the actual armor panels i'm actually using a big fat dry brush to kind of just mash in on our tread sending some of that deathless metal into these grates you know, just super simple, you know, hot and heavy. Before we even bother with these arrows, let's make sure we change these little fields to black. Always important to pull these sections off of the rhino. I'm using a quick wet blend technique where I'm just using black and blue to make it a highlight, forcing it in there for a quick blend. Again, we're just gonna start base coating some of these skulls using the same mix we used on the teeth up top, some browns, some ivories, maybe some yellows. Wet blend, brute force lay down, keeping it kind of opaque, a little bit wet just forcing a quick blend progressively adding more and more brightness a little bit brutish but that's fine a little wash will work that out then we're going to come back in and cut the rest of our trim in just kind of order of operations side quest sometimes i pick things out on models and make it really harder than it needs to be all right let's run back to that kind of flame yellow orange technique we've done this on mortarion several other of our videos and what I'm going to do is just kind of pull out extra detail, right? Just cool little features that I normally would just weather, but I want to take my time to make them cool. So what we're going to do is reset these little uh, slats and these uh, exhaust ports. We're going to make them yellow by first making them kind of white. Like it's like a light gray. I was lazy. And what we're going to do is just deploy kind of a standard base coat of yellow and just shove them in there where everything we painted was that white. And what this allows the yellow to do is be informed by something nice and bright rather than try to build up the low coverage yellow over something dark. This will allow the yellow to achieve its more maximum saturation. So a lot of times when we paint, we think of like going from dark to bright. But with yellow, you want to kind of get to that perfect yellow first, and then you want to back it, back it up, right? So we're going to back it up with some orange, right? We're going to just lower the opacity, maybe slightly introduce a little moisture. I'm actually using transparent orange from Monument Hobbies. And what we're going to do is just kind of pin wash it right up against the inner seam. And it's pretty moist, a little aggressive, that's okay, it's still wet. And what we're doing is just kind of bordering it, right? Creating a nice, strong sense of shadow uh, in that, kind of, like, but not really, because we're actually saying it's 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 on fire. So it's, we're just kind of bordering it. It's an interesting, it's an interesting, because normally you would say like, this is the dark area, which I guess in flame terms it is, because the yellow we're saying is the brightest spot. And then I'm just gonna, while it's still wet, force and bully in some of the yellow back in to kind of force that swirl. I'm just using really simple brush strokes, kind of just straight lines, tip of the brush, pulling straight back, kind of like a 3D printer, just linear drag. 
pull it back, pull it back. And then those lines are going to just blur together. Nice, smooth transitions. And that yellow staying pretty popping. And we're just going to kind of just run around and do this. Make sure to get all the shelves. Introduce the correct amount of orange on those ledges. Go back. Deploy some yellow as an edge highlight. And you see we're getting a nice, interesting look here. And then beyond that, you just do whatever you want. Right? You can spray some airbrushing down, try to create an OSL. I'm going to just stipple some orange in around it like it's like flex and embers. Not too big of a deal. You can introduce a little bit of white into your yellow and try to do like a center highlight really carefully. But really, it's just about having being blended. It's just like kind of almost just like stop start. Orange, yellow uh, with a slight blur. Not too difficult to do, just a little tedious. Every project has something about it that you can do to make it easier on yourself. <clears throat> in direct opposition of what I just talked about. All right, let's go back in time, guys. A little bit of gangster sub assembly. I find it very easy, especially with these rhinos, to just take all these little extra features off of them. <clears throat> Don't glue them until the end. Hit them with some double stick tape. I'm just literally sprayed them silver. Like that simple, guys. And now what I'm gonna do is just kind of recut the trim. And while I don't have them on the vehicles, this is much easier than when they're on the vehicles. And I'm just going to kind of take my time, figure out what I want to paint what. Like, do I want to paint the casing black? Do I want to paint the trim the same as the vehicle? Just keep that top hatch uh, metal. But having them just not on the vehicle, especially when they're such a simple uh, sub-assembly item, I find very easy. It's kind of a habit I've had from being a commission painter for all those years. And then we're just going to kind of pop through. Uh, do some quick window effects, then edge highlight the trim. And you'll notice that I didn't do a lot of blending on the the exterior just yet because I don't really have to on this small feature. All I got to do is get the color close, run some edge highlights in. So what we're going to do is a quick lens effect. I painted the real estate kind of a mid-blue, painting the bottom right of each window pane, each viewing angle, bottom right, highlight. That simple, right? And then we're just basically taking the same blue and just walking it deeper into the midtone by adding a little of that midtone to it. Quick blends. These are mostly just edge highlight technique. There's barely any blending actually happening here, guys. It's just picking the correct color and then running a quick series of lines to kind of softly blend it. And so the appearance is blended, but we're really doing almost nothing. But the important part of the effect is having the top left of the viewing angle purely black in the bottom right, finally purely white. And that will give you that effect. Now the final uh, exclamation point is putting a little white dot kind of on the sharpest corner of the black real estate. And that gives you a standard window lens, rhino hatch copula effect. Real simple, you can apply this technique to almost anything and you'll get that little bonus detail on your vehicle. Washing. Let's jump into the wash game, guys. I'm just grabbing some Army Painter stock dark tone. This is just black wash. And basically, I'm keeping it pretty straightforward out of the pot and just kind of like target locking the nuts and the bolts, just hitting it with a quick ring. I don't need to really wash the entire trim. It's good. It's better to just kind of lift those nuts and bolts out. Maybe you to highlight the trim later. If you need to throw a pin wash between the trim and the vehicle, just do that. More importantly, though, let's do a little bit of a... Uh, Mr. Hobby oil wash technique. Now, a lot of people sell streaking and grime products. At the end of the day, we're just talking it's an oil, and we're going to use spirits to create that streak. So what I'm doing is just taking the oil wash, which is already kind of thin. Now, the thicker the, the starting position, the more streaky and grimy you can get it. So this is just the, their stock solvent, basically just odorless spirits. And now that I've laid out a bunch of these little brown spots, I'm just going to kind of brush straight toward me straight lines, kind of a heart pull, and we're just going to kind of distort the oil into a singular pattern going all the same direction. And this is going to lower the opacity. It's going to lift a lot of the oil off the vehicle, create more of a transparent filtering quality to the oil wash. One of the advantages of using oils in this context is that filter it does, where it's like as we stretch it out and remove some of it, it does lower its opacity. And so you can do that several times. Whenever you're painting a box tank like this, a space marine vehicle, weathering is always on your mind. So let's jump into it. All right, let's introduce some pigments. Now, a lot of times I like using straight medical grade alcohol, 99%. And I'll use this because it dries super fast. 
and this is what I can introduce some of my weathering powders into. For this project, I've got some uh, violet and some uh, rusty, like red rust from Secret Weapon Miniatures. Lots of companies make pigments. Some of them are more gangster than others, aka they're more like, uh, you know, less forgiving, I think is the correct term. So when I'm going hot and heavy, right, I'm piling it on at the bottom here. I'm almost painting the tracks with this powdery color. I'm gonna really lower the uh, pigment ratio to the alcohol ratio and just kind of spot on a couple of little areas, right? Just little dots, little stipples, pop, pop, pop. Just kind of poke them out, make them a little bit more vibrant, a little bit dustier, right? And now I can also just convert to straight dry pigment using like a kind of a ghetto dry brush and use the more orangey version of this and kind of just dry it on, dust it on, right? and see how I can get that like smoky, dusty uh, dirt flavor to kind of just stick and be powdery. Now, the thing is, word of advice is like, when you do varnish this, it will set it, it'll never come off, but it will take some of the powderiness away. So usually after I varnish the model, I will introduce a little bit more powdery on top just to maintain a little of that. And it'll sit there just fine. It won't come off. Now that we've gotten almost all the way there, Let's introduce a little bit of chipping technique. I'm just using a pluck and pull sponge, grabbing some of our stock metal color we've been using, and I'm just gonna just rapid fire, hit some of the bottom ledges and the tank tracks right over the pigment with some stock metallics. Now you can go back and forth, darker metals, brighter metals. You can just use straight black. You can do a lot of things here, experiment, have fun, but the highest rule of all is, uh, you know, make sure that sponge is not just soaking wet. You know, just like, full of paint. You kind of want to treat it like a dry brush, right? You want to remove some of the excess paint so that you can move fast, you can push hard, and it'll deploy nice speckles, right? So I, t I usually spend some time taking some of that metal off using my construction paper in the background, right? And you get some really nice rapid fire speckling. Sometimes when I see I got a little too gangster in an area, I'll just grab some black and speckle in some black, right? And then go back to the metals, just back and forth. Just take your time, hit the ledges, get some really nice shipping effects on ledges. Now, just real quick, maybe my pigment wasn't enough. So I'm gonna grab like Infernal Orange from Privateer Press, and I'm gonna just send some of this on, gangster, right? Send some real nice flecks of orange. Send some flecks of black in, look at this. This is just one of the easiest techniques possible for making some intriguing uh, weathering techniques on the bottom of these uh, you know, treaded vehicles. And just look at that. Send a little black in right over the top and we got such a dimension here now we've got so much complexity with these two different weathering pigments a whole new uh orange was introduced and a black and i'm going to use similar techniques on the hatch okay i'm going to go back between our bright uh metal and our dark metal and i'm going to just kind of roughly and aggressively trace out edges stipple rapid fire uh you know increase the resolution decrease the resolution and just create a nice pitted textured effect okay and don't be afraid to use black for this too you see just stipple it in lower the opacity and i'm not even using a sponge here i'm just going through and just using my brush creating the same exact style of effect on this hatch so we have a little consistency between all our metal features real simple real fun guys this is where I'm going to leave it off today in our YouTube video. You may notice that those dozer blades have yet to be done in this video. Well, don't worry. On my Patreon page, which yes, does cost money, $10 a month to unlock all of our extended cuts. I've got an extra 10 minutes on top of what you just saw on how I'm going to use masking tape in the airbrush to generate some crispy, flawless chevrons on those blades. Either way, I really do appreciate you guys watching here on YouTube and supporting me. Hit that follow, like, whatever the social media term is the kids are using these days. I'll vote my shit. I don't fucking know. Anyway, thanks. And play on, players.